All right. Well, good morning. Happy Easter. I hope you guys enjoyed the pancakes. From what I heard from those of you who ate them, they were okay, right? Or crepes, whatever. Yell at me, whatever you want to do, crepes. You know, that's a French word, and I'm pretty sure it roughly translates to fancy people pancakes. Uh, so that's just what I was doing. I was just offering, you know, five-star restaurant quality crepes, uh, you know, it's just what I do on accident, because I didn't know that that's what that is. I won't press the pancakes next year. I heard that they were better this year than they were last year, though. So we're aiming for improvement. So, right? And I think if we're being honest, that's kind of a summary of the entire Christian walk, right? Is like always getting better day after day. So, you know, hopefully that's happening because it's at least happening to my pancakes. So at least my pancakes are getting better, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm getting better, right? And so, uh, you know, we're all on this giant walk in life. You know, that's, that's just the way pancakes and Christianity goes, is we're always looking to improve. But anyway, uh, I understand that we all just ate. I understand that we're all full. I understand that most of us are sleepy, myself included. And I also understand that it's Easter and we've got things to do. So for the most part, I'm going to try to keep this as brief as as possible while also unpacking like the longest chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians. So this is going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. But I hope that you'll at least take this journey with me. Uh, But just to give a quick preview, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, we've been in the book of 1 Corinthians for a really long time, and we've been looking at the different things that Paul has to say to the Corinthian church about how they should live as Christians and some of the the groundwork for what their new faith is going to look like in their life. And today we're going to be looking at the the 15th chapter, and there is a 16th, but I'm going to quickly summarize that towards the end of the sermon. Uh, But... Chapter 15, really for the most part, is how Paul wants to really conclude his first letter to the Corinthian church. Okay, so that's really the the point that he wants to make, and it's because it deals with the resurrection. So if you weren't really sure how 1 Corinthians was going to play into Easter and how I was going to be able to pull it off, I did. Somehow, and by I, I mean God, because it was really just kind of God working through uh, the, the sermon series because I was worried about how this was going to play out as far as my plan was going, and I was working on, you know, do I scrap uh, Corinthians and, you know, just do an Easter-focused thing, or do I keep going with First Corinthians? And as things drew nearer and nearer, and I realized the direction that it was going, especially with me missing a handful of Sundays uh, to have somebody fill in for me, God's timing really just panned out, which, funny enough, I guess I should know that as a preacher, that God's timing is better than our own, and that everything that he does works for the benefit of the good, for those who who love him. We know that. That's in the book of Romans. And today we are seeing that argument really flushed out as Paul deals with the resurrection of Jesus, but as he also deals with the resurrection of us. As believers. And so that is the, the premise that, that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 takes. But before we dig in, I really just wanted to, to highlight something as far as the hope that the resurrection of Christ brings. Now, it's Easter, and we've been in the Easter season for a while. And I was talking to my mom, and as many of you know, uh, my mom was just here not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, her and I, we've, we've talked, and uh, we've had relatively consistent communication since she left, and she got to talking to me, and, you know, she, I'm wearing this because of her, uh, you know, if I could have it my way, I would have stayed in the shorts and the t-shirt that I was cooking in, but mom's going to watch this, so suit. Uh, even went home, got the tie, okay? That way mom doesn't fly back. So anyway... Um, <laughs> So I was talking to her about this sermon in particular and about Easter in in particular. And 
she was just talking, and as, as we were talking on the phone, she got very emotional. Uh, she got very emotional, and she would have no problem with me talking about this, but uh, she got very emotional because Easter stirs emotions in my mom, if I'm being honest. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my mom has gone through a lot of hardship in her life regarding people that she's lost. Uh, so when I was two, my mom lost a daughter. Uh, so my, my sister, she passed away from spina bifida at the age of 13. Uh, and so she was born that way, you know, born with, with spina bifida, and her and my mom had had conversations about, uh, you know, what her life expectancy could be. And so my mom really had to wrestle through some of that stuff uh, as far as, you know, how do you talk to a young child that her illness might cause her to not be here one day? And so my, my mom had to, had to really wrestle with that. And when my sister was 13, she ended up passing away from the condition. And so that was a real hard time for my mom, naturally. Uh, and then fast forward a, a little bit, and about five years later, my grandfather passed away um, on my mom's side. And so my, my mom lost her dad five years after losing her daughter. Uh, fast forward some more time, and uh, my aunt passed away from cancer when I was 13. And so from seven to 13, you know, roughly six years, my mom lost a, a sister. And fast forward, my mom lost my, uh, my grandmother. And then fast forward, my mom lost my father and my mom lost another sister. And my mom can't help but feel like she might be next because she's the next oldest. And so far, uh, nobody, as far as her siblings go, have made it to the age of 65, and my mom is 64 right now. And so, as this time has approached, there's a reason that I bring this up. As this time has approached for my mom, it stirs a lot of emotions for her. And if I'm being honest, it stirs a lot of emotions for me as well, right? And so, for those of you who don't know, uh, I mentioned that my mom lost a, her husband. That would be my dad. So, my dad passed away uh, about almost six years ago now. And for those of you who, who don't know my story, uh, I was engaged, I had a fiance, and less than 90 days after I lost my dad, uh, my fiance was killed in a car accident uh, due to, to snow. And uh, naturally, this, this time period, it, it stirs a lot of emotions for, for me and my mom. And the, the reason I bring this up is that I think for the most part, many of you can relate. I think for the most part, many of you can relate. Many of you have lost loved ones. Many of you have lost parents. You've lost grandparents. Many of you have lost children, and you've lost uh, those who are near and dear to you, and you've lost spouses, and you've, you've, you've lost. Many of you have lost. Many of us have lost. We all find ourselves in this, this never-ending timeline of life where the inevitable is that we eventually lose. And that's why the, this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is so important to me. That's why the day of, of Easter, when we remember what Jesus did, when we remember the, the sacrifice, the death that he endured on the cross, and more importantly, when we remember the resurrection that he had three days later, it brings hope to people like you and me. Because as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see that it's not just Jesus' resurrection that we're talking about when we come to the, the season that is Easter it's the resurrection of all believers and the hope that that brings to people like you and to me. And so as Paul argues out 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and this, this chapter, it's 58 verses long, and the entire chapter is very long-winded, and for the biggest chunk of his chapter, of this chapter that we're looking at, Paul is dealing with the resurrection of Jesus and how we know that Jesus died and he died for your sins, he died for my sins, he died for us and he raised to new life 
Three days later, that's the first portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He raised to new life, and then as Paul continues this argument, he shows that, look, it didn't just end there. It didn't just end with Jesus being raised from the dead, but he rose from the dead so that you and I can be raised into new life and life eternal. Friends, I tell you the truth. There is hope in the resurrection. And that's the argument that Paul even lays out. He talks about how if Jesus died and never raised, there'd be no hope. But beyond that, that if Jesus died and raised, but we don't also raise, there is still no hope. But he says that, that Jesus, after he died and he raised to life, he came to his disciples and he showed himself to them and he gave them the hope and then he later gave Paul the hope and he later gave the 500 people that were in the upper room the hope and the same hope is given to you and to me. And that's what Paul is trying to make clear to the Corinthian church. And to pick up in verse 50, this is what Paul has to say. Now that he's laid all of this out, he says this. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your sting? Or where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is a hard life. This is a hard life. Is there anybody in here who would disagree that this life that we live is hard? No, I would, I would probably say that for the most part, many of you have been through hardships, and it doesn't matter how young you are, it doesn't matter how old you are, you have experienced some form of hardship. But there's hope. Many of you, you've experienced death. Many of you will. I would argue that most will. And I'll be honest. When it first comes, when it knocks on your doorstep or the doorstep of a loved one, and you read something like, death, where is your sting? That's a hard passage to read. Because when you're going through it, the only thing you can think about is how much it hurts. that stinging sensation, that painful sensation of death. It's there, and it lingers, and it hurts, and from time to time it comes back. But because of what Jesus did, that sting will inevitably go away. It will. That sting eventually comes to an end. I was asked this earlier, and I'm not going to throw out a name, okay? I said I wouldn't, so I'm not going to bring up who. 
but you know who you are. I got asked today about whether or not we are going to recognize each other in heaven. I got asked that, and there are some who would disagree with me, I'll admit. There are some who who would disagree with me. I believe that we will. I believe that when we die, when we are no more, when Jesus comes back and he makes all of this right, when we are given our, our new body and our new spirit, and when we are all one body yet again to worship and be in the presence of the creator himself, when we are all together, I believe that we will recognize each other. I believe that I'm going to look out and say, hey, I remember you. I remember the time that we worshiped together. I remember the time that you made fun of my pancakes and called them crepes. I remember uh, when this, I remember when that, I remember you. Now, I'll admit, for those of you who, who might be a little fearful about the whole, you know, maybe multiple spouses that may have passed away thing, I'm going to Okay, let's, let's elaborate. I don't think that we're going to have the same kind of relationships that we do here on earth. I don't believe that it's going to be, this was my daughter, this was my son, this was my mother, my father, my brother, my uncle, my aunt. I don't believe that, and the reason that I don't believe that is this. I believe it's because when we are all reunited together, we are no longer mother, son, father, daughter, brother, sister, we are, well, I shouldn't have said that last one because I believe that's exactly what will be. But you get the point. Not earthly. We will all be brothers and sisters reunited, worshiping our Lord God, the creator. The creator of heaven and earth. And the creator of hope and light. The same hope and light that's offered to you. I wanted to kind of wrap this up uh, with something that we had discussed last week at our Bible study. Uh, last week at our, at our Bible study, we've been going uh, through kind of the journey to the cross and looking at uh, some of the, the different roads that were walked uh, throughout Jesus' life leading up to his death and leading up to his resurrection and even beyond his resurrection. And one of the things that we talked about last week was from the book of Acts, and we, we looked at a guy named uh, Gamaliel. Uh, so Gamaliel, he was a, a Pharisee. Uh, he sat on the Sanhedrin, so he was kind of like one of these top dog Pharisees. And one of the things that, that ends up happening in the book of Acts, and you can find it in Acts chapter 5, is that as Acts chapter 5 is unfolding, Peter, John, and all the other disciples, they've, they've gone out into Jerusalem, and they've, they've gone into their known world, and they're looking to spread the gospel, and they're trying to get the word out about Jesus the same way that, that you and I are, and, and the same hope, and they're trying to spread this hope. And what ends up happening is Peter and John, and uh, they get arrested, so they get arrested, they get put on trial, and this guy, Gamaliel, he comes to the Sanhedrin because they're, they're trying to think of what punishment can we give to these people. They've already been arrested before, and we told them, hey, stop preaching this, this message that you have, but they won't stop. What can we do? And Gamaliel comes to them, and he says, listen, I have an idea. He says, how about we just let them go? How about we just let these guys go, and here's his thought process behind that. Jesus was not the first person that people believed to be the Messiah. If I'm just being honest, Jesus was not the first person that came along and people were like, hey, this guy's the Messiah. It had happened many, many, many times before. And so Gamaliel says, hey, let's just treat this like one of those times. Let's just treat this like one of those times, one of those people, and here's what's happened before. If we just let them go, we just let them do their thing, if this is not true, it's going to fizzle out. And his, word, his words are basically, if this is human's will, it will die. It will die out. It will fizzle out. And this is what his, his, the next words out of his mouth says. But if it is of God, who can stop it? 
If this gospel message that, that, that these people are preaching, the forgiveness of sins, the hope of eternal life, if this message is simply a human message, it's going to fizzle out the way that the rest of them have. But if it is of God, who is going to stop it? That was said 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, this was said, and 2,000 years later, it has not fizzled out. 2,000 years later, this message of hope, this message of forgiveness, this message of mercy, of grace, of truth has not died, but has continued. And friends, I tell you the truth, it will continue until Christ comes back to see it complete. That's the hope that we can hold on to. That's the hope that we can hold on to. The hope of life because of the death of Christ and his resurrection. The point that I want to make is this. The cross of Christ was the cost of life. Because of what Jesus did on the cross almost 2,000 years ago, you and I have life paid for eternally. This body that we have now, this life that we live now, Paul calls it corruptible. He calls it mortal. But Jesus died so that you and I can have the hope an assurance of what's incorruptible and immortal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you for your son. I thank you for his death on a cross. God, I thank you for the life that it brings to us. God, I thank you so much for your grace. God, we are broken and corrupt people. God, we make mistakes, we trip, we tumble, we fall. But God, because of your son, we can be forgiven. Because of your son, when we fall, we can get back up. God, this time is tough for many people. God, it's easy for us to think about the people who aren't here with us now. But God, I pray that we would look to the time that we'll be with them once again. God, I thank you that death has been swallowed up in victory. God, that because of what your son did, death no longer has power over us. Only eternal life granted through you. God, we love you, and we thank you for this life. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Now, I did mention that I was going to uh, do chapter 16, so I'm going to quickly summarize that. Paul basically just says, hey, there's a bunch of people at your church. Tell them I said, hey. Also, one of the things he brings up is, not to forget to collect the money for his mission. And with that, we're into a segue about the building fund offering. So this is the final Sunday of the month, and so this is the time of invitation. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, any praises that you would like to have lifted up, any decisions that you would like to make, the message of truth and grace is freely given to all who are willing to believe. And so if you've not made that step, if you've not made that decision, this is a good time to do so. You're more than welcome to come and, and talk to me. Um, and as the, the time of invitation wraps us up, uh, the band's going to come and lead us in one final song, and the ushers are going to pass around the plate for the building fund if you feel called to, to give to that.